Hi, it's Dr. Phoenix. Today we're going to start looking at the role that energy plays in living things. We know that living things require energy. It's one of the attributes of life. And the energy source that ultimately is responsible for keeping us all alive is the sun. Uh, plants absorb energy from the sun and through a process called photosynthesis uh, convert that energy into chemical energy in the form of sugar, particularly glucose, which is then uh, made into starch in some plants. Animals eat the plants uh, and get energy from the plants, and animals eat the animals that eat the plants and get energy from them. And so we, we all ultimately get our energy from the sun. Now organisms that can make their own energy, such as plants, are called autotrophs. And those organisms, such as animals and humans, that have to obtain their energy from foods are called heterotrophs. Now, although plants make glucose, and glucose is a great energy molecule, it's, it, it has quite a bit of energy stored in it, um, cells cannot use glu glucose uh, as an energy source. They have to actually break it down into smaller packets of energy. And I like to use the analogy of a, of a drink machine. If you have a $10 bill and want to go to the drink machine, do you have enough money to buy a Coke? And the answer obviously is yes, you have plenty of money to buy a drink. However, it's not in the correct form. You need to convert that $10 bill into quarters. Quarters would allow you to purchase the drink. So in living cells, glucose would be like our $10 bill that needs to be converted into quarters, which would be analogous to ATP in the cells. Okay, so ATP we could say is the energy currency in living cells. Now, ATP consists of three basic parts. It consists of um, an adenine molecule, which we saw um, when we looked at nucleotides, DNA and RNA. It has a ribose sugar molecule, which we saw in RNA. And it has three phosphate groups. So basically, if you took off these two phosphate groups, what you would have is an RNA nucleotide containing adenine, a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. So a sugar, a phosphate, and a base is called adenosine monophosphate, one phosphate. If we take a phosphate group and attach it to AMP, we now have adenosine diphosphate, ADP. And if we attach a third phosphate, we now have adenosine triphosphate. Now it's these three phosphate groups that are key to ATP's ability to store energy. Notice that these phosphate groups are negatively charged. And I'm sure you understand that molecules that have the same charge repel each other normally. Well these molecules are being held together and so in order for them to be held together when they would normally want to be pushed apart, these bonds must be very strong and they are referred to as very high energy bonds. So when those bonds are broken, energy can be released and used um, as an energy source within the cell. So here we have ATP. These are the high energy bonds and when uh, this third phosphate is broken off, when that bond is broken, it is like a spring being released and energy is released which can be used by the cell. Now notice what's left behind. When this third phosphate group is broken off, we're left with ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and a free phosphate group. So we can consider ADP and ATP kind of like a rechargeable battery. ADP has a little bit of energy in it. It's like a partially charged battery. ADP 
plus a phosphate is like a partially charged battery. If we plug in a char uh, rechargeable battery, it will completely charge up, and that's what ATP uh, can be analogous to. ATP is like a charged battery. When that third phosphate group is connected, we now have much more energy stored in this molecule than we had with ADP. As we are going through life functions, um, the energy that's stored in these bonds um, can be released, as we just saw, when the third phosphate group is broken off. And so as uh, these requirements are, are needed, um, that third phosphate group will break off, releasing, re releasing the energy so the cell can do certain things. What are some of the things that the cell needs to do that requires energy? Well, the cell, uh, we saw uh, earlier that the cell has little pumps in their membrane that, re that uh, requires energy to move ions and molecules against the concentration gradient. There are chemical reactions such as protein synthesis that require energy. And muscle contraction also requires a great deal of energy so that we can uh, move and heat up our bodies. Now although ATP is a great energy source, it's not a great way to store large amounts of energy. But fortunately ATP can be regenerated uh, rather quickly. And so there's a continuous cycle going on of ATP breaking off a of phosphate releasing that energy for energy needs within the cell, and then ADP having that, re, uh, that phosphate reattached uh, from energy that we gain from food sources. This occurs in the mitochondria of cells in, uh, through a process called cellular respiration that we'll look at during this unit. All right, so ATP and ADP are constantly being recycled uh, as energy is uh, pulled out of ATP and then ADP is recharged through our food sources. All right, I hope that helps you and if there's any questions please bring them to class or send them to me now on the discussion link um, through my big campus. All right, have a great day.